Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Spring Docs Q&A. My name is Camelia Shofani, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Events at IDA. I am going to visually identify myself. I have dark curly hair. I'm a light-skinned Mexican-Palestinian woman with dark eyes, and I'm wearing a white button-down with an office backdrop. I want to thank our media sponsors, Variety and KCRW, for sponsoring our 2023 Spring Docs. Tonight, we'll be having a conversation between Variety's senior artisans editor, Jazz Tenke, and documentary filmmaker, Margaret Brown, whose film Descendant is currently streaming on Netflix. To see more of our lineup, please visit documentary.org forward slash Spring Docs. And before we get started, as always, I'd like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. We recognize the Gabrielino Tongva and Chumash peoples as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land, water, and cultural resources in the unceded territory of Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Andrea Lust, for ASL interpreting this discussion. So I'll pass it over to Jazz. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jazz Tanke, Senior Artisans Editor at Variety and excited to be here today. I'm moderating from my home office and I have medium brown hair and I'm wearing a black top. And I am from South London, hence the accent. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce filmmaker of Netflix descendant, Margaret Brown. Hi, Margaret. Hi. I'm wearing a floral shirt and um, glasses. And this is my dog, Max Pickle, who's sick. Oh, poor Max. Um, well, I'm excited to talk to you about your work on Descendant because we've had several conversations about it and it's, you know, screening for the audience here. But for those who don't know, I mean, take us back into how the story presented itself to you. Sure. Um, well, I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, and Africatown is part of the city of Mobile. Um, it was annexed by Mobile. And um, so I made another film 17 years ago called Order of Myths that's about segregated Mardi Gras in Mobile. And the white queen that year, there's a black queen and king and a white king and queen, was Helen Mayer from the Mayer family that is featured in Descendant. And um, so you know, I I hadn't heard growing up in Mobile about the Clotilda. I didn't know the story, but my mother said to me, um, as I embarked on making the Order of Myths 17 years ago, she said, you know, the Mayer family is the family that brought the Clotilda to the United States. And I hadn't, you know, I didn't know that. And so I kind of filed it away, but it wasn't until um, Stephanie Lucas, the black Mardi Gras queen, I was filming with her after Mardi Gras was over, and her grandfather said when we were filming them, we were filming with her grandfather, grandmother, and her around their kitchen table. And he said that he was just, he was a descendant of the Clotilda. And then I realized the two queens were connected. And it was like the whole the whole like film shifted under me in that moment. And so then years later, um, you know, I sort of made in a way like a spiritual follow up to the Order of Myths because um, yeah, th these two these two worlds were connected. Yeah, I love that. And what's so fascinating is I don't, you know, I mean, this is a story that never gets told in school, right? And it's not told, you know, you have to do a deep dive to find it in our history books. And what's so fascinating about this documentary is like the voices you use, like, you know, it's, and I think there's a quote in there, like, I'm telling you the story so it doesn't get lost. And it's, it's a beautiful oral history and um you know talk about how you were gonna present the story like and navigate it given that there actually isn't so much of this out there I mean I think that um the way I went into it was really differently than the film that happened um I thought when I started that so many of the white families would speak to me um in Mobile like they did in Order of Myths and it turned out that no one wanted a lot of like the white mobile was like fairly silent. Um, there were a few people who spoke, but 
for the most part, it was the community of Africatown and, um, and uh, you know, they were, they, they wanted to tell the story. They were proud of the story. And um, so it became something different than I thought. And I had to pivot and, you know, include um, realizing my whiteness was then a problem. Like I had to figure out ways to include other creative voices to kind of navigate my blind spot. So um, yeah, it was, it was just like, it was, it was a very humbling, but, but amazing experience because also it was a very direct creative collaboration with the people in the film who, I don't usually do this, but I would show them scenes as we were shooting and be like, are you okay with this? And it just seemed like appropriate for this film. I don't know if I would do that for a film again, but it just felt like this is so clearly their story. They are the master storytellers. Like I have to make sure I'm getting it right. If I got it wrong, it would be a disaster. So it was kind of collaborative from like every way you can imagine. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so, you know, so such a important story that way. But you know, you talk about blind spots and, um, you know, how did you get the community to trust you aside from showing them the footage of like, you know, and then how does, because I think that's, that's one of the arts of, of verite yeah. st storytelling, right? Like you start one way and it goes another way because a voice comes in, like talk about how get earning that trust to help you tell the story that we, we actually end up seeing in the documentary and who were those voices that were integral to that? Well, first of all, like, because I'm from Mobile, I'm not an outsider. And I'd made another film in that community 17 years ago. Some people already knew who I was. And really early on, um, Emmett, who, you know, I, I met making this film, I didn't know him back in the day when I made Order of Myths. He, um, I gave him a copy of, um, of Order of Myths to watch. And he held screenings in the community at his house. He also asked me if he could have a lot more DVDs and he would like pass them out to people. So people would know like why I was there and what I was doing. So in a way, like he was an emissary for the film. Um, and, you know, he, it, it was, it, that was really early on. And before I even knew what a big, a big um, piece he would be in the telling of the story. I mean, I knew that he was a master storyteller and I wanted him to be in the story, but um I wasn't sure yet like how how much he would actually be in the story. So he opened some doors for me. Kern Jackson, um, the folklorist in the film, who is also a co-writer and a co-producer on the film, he'd been, excuse me, he'd been working in the community for 25 years since he was like a student collecting oral histories. So, you know, it, it was a steady thing. Like we made the film over four and a half years and we're still, you know, I'm still part of a cohort who's doing activist work in the community. Um, not, you know, not led by the filmmakers, but led by the community, sort of as you see in the film. And um, and so there was just a bunch of doors that sort of slowly opened, you know, because we just kept going back and and embedding ourselves. And I mean, I think that's what every filmmaker or so many films that are made in the way this was filmed, like that's what you do. You just have to stay and you have to um, have the conversations that are so outside the frame of what you're filming. You have to go for coffee. You have to go for walks. Like you have to just sort of, I mean, it was just a constant process of checking in and making sure the people I was featuring were, were all on the same page with the way the story is being presented, you know, because like I said before, that was like the most important thing. Yeah. And, you know, like who were some of the voices that were key to telling that story? Um, well, to me, like, this is sort of, um, I wouldn't say this is like an auteur driven film. It's like a collective driven film. And um, so I would say that like Kern was, because Kern and I collaborated, we collaborated on Order of Myths as well. And um, there's this like coffee shop in Mobile, we would always meet, like, even when we weren't in between Order of Myths and Descendant, we would meet and talk about sort of a lot of the issues swirling around like race and class in Alabama and carnival and then also Africa town what was happening in Africa town and so he was someone I was just always checking in with whenever I would go home because I don't live in Mobile I live I live here in Austin and um and sometimes in LA but mostly in Austin and so um he was a really important voice obviously Emmett became someone I really trusted Joycelyn became someone I mean she's you know, she's like the person in her family that's sort of been chosen to pass down the story. And she runs a festival in Africa town every year that you see in the film where there's a different theme every year. And, um, and it's a really amazing community event. And then Vita and I 
became really close. And she's now working as an activist in the community. That's her full-time job now. And um, so she, you know, you, you get to sort of see these people because we're making the film for so long, partly because of COVID, you know, I just like, you can't shoot, you couldn't shoot during COVID. So that in a way was sort of a blessing, even though it was very difficult to get to see the process of the community over this many years. Yeah, I love that. The other thing that I really love is the visual language of that. Like, talk about working with your cinematographers and how you wanted that language, what you wanted that the visual language to, to reflect. Because I think it also captures the community so well. Um, yeah, talk about that a little. Well, it's funny that you should say that about the community, because actually that was something Essie and I talked about a lot, because early on, um, you know, Africatown is, it, you can look at it many different ways, because in some ways it's a blighted community because it's surrounded by um, industry and, um, you know, the city doesn't really take care of it the way it does other neighborhoods. And, you know, but there's another way to look at it, which is that people have, there's a, the biggest community garden in the city is in Africatown. I mean, sorry, in the state of Alabama is in Africatown. It's, it's, a, it's like um, um, Joe Womack in the film says, if, if you like, greens and collards like you'll never go hungry because there's so many every year that they're just constantly growing in the garden um and then people have you know flowers in their yard and it's just a very lush tropical place and essie early on was like again like you know you're you are sort of missing the lushness of it and um and she's not a cinematographer she was a creative producer on the project so but she was also very much involved in the look of it you know um, but my two cinematographers who are very close collaborators that I'm working with on new projects now as well, um, Zach Manuel and Justin Zweifak, um, we, you know, we talked a lot about, there's this, there's this feeling of sort of majesty of this story and the people who've been passing down this story for generations, for 160 years, they're, they're master storytellers and the camera has to acknowledge that. So a lot of time we were talking about like the camera should be slightly from below. Um, you know, it was it was just talking about like how do we how do we make sure everyone's seeing this how we see it, you know, and not in like overbearing ways and subtle ways. And um, and then also um, you know, incorporating the Zora Neale Hurston part of it all, like incorporating the sort of visual language that wasn't verite, that wasn't interviews, it's like this whole other thing. Um that's about like the, the descendants telling their story, but but told through the words of Zora Neale Hurston that she wrote down from Emmett's ancestor, Cujo Lewis, a hundred years ago. Um, so figuring out like how to work that sort of visual poetry within um, this unfolding story over four and a half years. So the Tortula was actually discovered in 2019. Yet when we're watching the documentary, like that doesn't become the center point of the story like oh here's the ship it's been found like but it becomes part of the storyline within the community like how did you want to approach that aspect of it and not make it about you know like we found the titanic it, 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 as yeah. such. i mean for me like joycelyn says it better than i could in the film she goes it's not about that ship it, you know it's about the community and so I actually did not think they would find the ship. Like, I remember when Jim Delgado from Search, who was, who was one of the people who was looking for the ship, he said really early on, there's one place left to look. And if we look in that one place and it's not there, then we're, we're never gonna find the ship. We've looked in all the other places. And I remember being at that meeting and being like, oh, they're, they're never gonna find it. But I didn't think like, oh, that means I don't have a story because the story was really the people. It wasn't about the ship. And so I, I, when they did find the ship, it was, it was incredible. And it did open up dramatically for the story, a lot of, a lot of things. And you got to see what happens after they find it and, and what changes, you know? So it's, it is a dramatic point, but I already knew um, that I had a film, you know, because I knew I had these master storytellers and it, it, there were so many of them. There were so many people connected to the story that were just these, these characters that you dream of. Um, of having so much connection to their past. So they were living history. They were, they were embodying this, this like just indelibly important American history. So I, I never even thought about it really. I thought 
if they find it great if they don't like I don't care yeah and what's so beautiful about this is you know part of the film is this legacy like you were telling a story about history the environmental racism that's surrounding it all there's also the website descendantfilm.com um talk about the impact you know the film has been out now for a while it's on netflix globally available like the response that you've had from the community what it means what people can do as next steps after watching this that's a great question i mean um you know i think everyone has a lot of opinions about streamers but for this film and the impact it has for pe so many people to watch it all over the world it's it's the best possible home for this film and um and we were so excited to to get to partner with netflix in the release of the film and you know um yeah, it was a dream come true because of so many people, so many more people have seen this film than any of my other films because of the platform and its global reach. And, and um, you know, in terms of what's happened in the community, like, I mean, the community travels basically every weekend all over the world to speak in different places. And there's also a cohort there that is very active and kind of, there's, there's something that um, Kamal Siddiqui, um, the diver, the black diver says in the film, he says, you you as a community need to figure out what justice means for you and um it's been amazing to watch them grapple with that as a community and you know i mean i'm outside of it as the filmmaker but i'm i'm included in a lot of the like updates and everything and you know and i'm also obviously involved in the activism and care about the community but i'm not a part of the community and um, it's just been amazing to watch them figuring out as a community with many different voices and ideas and egos and dreams to figure out what that looks like for them as a community. And um, it's it's an ongoing thing. It's developing, but it's, you know, um, I don't know. It's it's just been really impressive. And I've and it was already an activist community. It wasn't like <laughs> the film created that. It was already totally in place. Like one of the things that that first struck me when I came back after Order of Myths and started making the Senate was just how many meetings there are in Africatown. Because Africatown is 2,500 people and the larger like mobile area is like half a million. And I guarantee you there's more activist meetings in Africatown in any given week than like probably the rest of the city combined. It's really inspiring that people care that much about this legacy. So yeah, it's it's been amazing to watch it grow and kind of solidify into plans for different ways to use the land, um, different ways to, you know, work with protecting the historic part of Africatown. There's a, um, there's a museum opening next month in Africatown that we've been waiting for a really long time. That's going to be really exciting. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. What about conversation starters too, like in terms of the film being a way for, you know, the community to have conversations that, you know, a, a difficult I guess you know yeah. anything to do with race is always difficult right so how has the film led to better conversations I mean I've seen it on so many levels like I, I mean um you know you can talk about when we've traveled to London and filmed it there and kind of um Joycelyn and Questlove came um to that and it was like I think we stayed in the theater for three hours afterward talking to people and crying with people and talking about their response to the movie it was super you, you just don't know what you're going to find after the movie sometime how people are going to take it and just to be able to like bear witness and listen has been I mean it's just I feel so honored to be a part of that conversation um in terms of like the super local level I think the community some some of the plants in the in the um in Africa town have left um, the mayor of Mobile historically owned um, a lumber a lumber yard that surrounds Lewis's quarters. And about three weeks before the film came out on Netflix, they kind of hightailed it out. Um, or they they said they were they didn't like they haven't like left yet, but they said they were closing and moving. So um, that happened just you know right before the release and. Um, and then there's been some um, zoning victories, um, but all that is super ongoing and, and frankly, like a hard fight. Um, but there's a lot of 
you know, because of the film and just because of the work that's already been done there, there is a lot of support. And now there's some support from the federal level. Like we went to the White House um, this winter and um, had a screening um, in DC at the Smithsonian, the African American Museum at the Smithsonian that's featured in the film and got a lot of partners that way. So it's all like, I mean, it's a slow roll, but it's, it's happening. Love so it. it's really exciting, yeah. That's the impact of this. And, you know, you talked earlier about the blind spots that you had, like, you know, when you first started, like, what did you learn as a filmmaker? What did you take away from it? Hearing these stories and the voices. You, I mean, you just realize how much you don't know until you really listen and deeply listen. I mean, and I think um, this is a story I felt like as a white person, I'm, I like, you know, I, I thought I was making a story that's about slavery. That was more just about when I started, not what I made, but um, that was, you know, I think like slavery is something that like, it is our homework as white Southerners and just white Americans to like grapple with this. It's not up to black people to do all the work. And so I thought, okay, you know, this is happening in my hometown. I wanna do some of the work. And, but then, you know, the film just shifted under my feet, like they documentaries have a way of doing. And I just had to really listen to what it was telling me it wanted to be, you know? And, um, and it, it wanted to be the voices of this community, clearly, you know? So I had to just figure out how to listen as deeply as I could to what those voices were telling me. And some of these were ancestral voices. Some of these were in the voices of, Zora Neale Hurston and Cujo Lewis. So I had to figure out what's the best way to tell that. So I had to go to the community and ask them. I had to go to my partners and ask them. And we had to figure out together the best way to tell the story, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. And I know we, we, we sort of touched on it. We mentioned the website, but like as a call to action, if people watch this film and they want to help the community take it home, Margaret, what can they do? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can help. Um, uh, DescendantFilm.com is the website. And um, we're also partnered with this organization in Memphis called The Big We. And um, together, uh, and I think that information is now on the website. The website's constantly updating. So um, I don't know, by the time this comes out, it might be slightly different. But, um, but yeah, all the organizations that are in um, the film are also on the website. So if you're interested in the environmental racism aspect of the film, you can get in touch with me, Jack, or Chess and talk to Joe or Ramsey. Um, if you're interested in the Clotilda Descendants Association, like there's a way to connect to them. Um, there's, you know, if you were interested in talking to the Big We, which is sort of, they kind of more encompass just like um, getting the community to work together. And I'm not sure if that part is on the website when this airs, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways you can directly get involved and also everyone knows everyone. So if you write a group and you tell them, you know, you want to work on this, they will point you in the right direction. Amazing. Amazing. Margaret, thank you so much for that incredible yeah. conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I love hearing from you about Descendant and your incredible work on this film and, you know, sharing this the story of this incredible community and giving us a history lesson that we, you know, that isn't always, that it has not been taught. So, yeah. Thank you for well, sharing you today. For yeah, of course. I'll always. see you soon. Thanks so much. It's great. Always catching up with you.